Today we'll be talking about ripple editing in Reaper. It's likely that this has happened to you if you're new to Reaper or it has happened to you if you're not so new to Reaper. And I think it's useful to know when to use it, how to use it, which situations can you take more advantage of. I will show it using a multitrack, a larger session, some sound selection or loop selection sessions. And as usual, my only goal is for you to have more resources and more strategies when you're trying to do something in Reaper. Straight from Mexico City, my name is Juanchis. And today I have different sessions. So remember that you can always open your action list under actions show, show action list or by hitting the keyboard shortcut that shows up right there. And in my case, since I have already a video on all of my toolbars, you can see up top to the left that I have a small icon that's here in red with a small, with a small light in green circling around. And that's giving me visual info of the ripple state of my editing. And that relates to my actions. As you can see, I have my command shift R to cycle ripple editing modes. You have different ripple edit modes that you can use. I honestly don't think it makes too much sense to have three different ones. And I instead prefer to cycle through them. Okay, so this icon, I want you to keep like a close eye on it. It will be in three different ways. If it's completely white, it means that it's turned off. If it's on red, it means that it's in the single track stage or in the global stage. And if I hit my shortcut again, it's still on red. And now it's a global setting. If I hit my shortcut again, it goes back to that. <laughs> the way the toolbar icons reflect the state of an option in Reaper can be modified by right clicking up customizing your toolbar. And in this case, Ripple Cycling Editing Mode. And I have the option highlight with animation based on toggle state. So if it's enabled, it will be animated, or you can have it blinking if you don't like the roundish thing. Uh, whatever you like the most, that's what you should use. You can have the highlight option, as you can see. I would honestly wouldn't go too deep into this. I would only go into highlight animation or just let this as a fast blink so it's not moving around. But I want this to have a different color if it's on. And I think red overall for my eyes and for my way of understanding means that something is on or is something to pay attention to, such as my lock state for my whole project. So I set this up right here. And for example, the first way to use it is if you're doing podcast editing. And for example, here is one of my videos that I'm editing for my YouTube channel, right? So after importing the media, after importing the MP5, the MP4 video and using the Explode Multistream media file, since I'm recording multi-channel with OBS, I get these different files well, this, where this is the source file that contains everything as it was recorded. This is only the video. This is channels, I don't remember, maybe one and two. This is probably three and four. And this is probably five and six inside of the MP4. And now I can edit all of them separately. And you can do all of that using OBS. And I have my vocal chain set up and such. So usually what happens when you're editing podcast or video or any kind of post-production, what will happen is that you will end up editing all of this. And if you have to do delete and then grab all of them, slide them to the left, this is super slow. So there's something called ripple editing. So what I can do is I can activate this globally. Remember that I have a shortcut. I have this globally set on. And whenever I delete this, it will slide from the right to the left. Another actions that might be useful here is that I have split times at time selection or razor edit. Remember that all of the actions will be found in the description of the video. So I can have this. And since all of my tracks are also grouped on the media razor edit follow, whatever I do to one single track, if I split all of these media items and then delete them, it will immediately go and I can start removing silence. I can also combine this with split at previous cross settings. So I can split the media item, split again, and then select and delete. Or the one that I like the most, 
because I think this is the fastest one, is to use an action that splits under cursor and selects left. That way, whenever I'm just hovering my mouse, I don't have to click on my mouse. I can just move my mouse around, hit E, move my mouse, uh, mouse around, hit E, and then just hit delete, and I'm instantly deleting all of the silence that I don't need. You could even add a shortcut to use the select right, uh, like that works if you like, if you feel like you need it and it's going to really improve your workflow, that's working great. But that's one way of using the global ripple editing in Reaper. Another way to use the global editing in Reaper is if you have something like this big live session that I recorded of a show, uh, and I have different tracks, maybe I have small spaces between these tracks when the singer or the main music director was talking. And again, I can just split at time selection. I can just take advantage of the regions where I have the beginning and the end of the songs. And on this time that's completely dead where there are no claps or anything, <laughs> I can just double click between these two regions. It will make a time selection between those two time regions, I can hold shift, click E, and I can use my split at time selection. These are selected, and with my global ripple editing, I can just remove that extra space. I can do that for all of the spaces between the songs, then I can worry about the fades. And since I usually start recording before the show starts, so I don't forget about it, I can just double click again on the timeline, and it will select all of the empty space before the first region, and it will drag it completely to the left. If you have some extra space and you want to drag everything to the beginning of the project, what you can do is double click again on the top of the arrangement. You can select one of the tracks and I'm using insert new MIDI item. I can extend the MIDI item, then I can delete it and everything will be pushed all the way to the left. And please remember that this also relates with your project settings and where does your project start. If your start measure is minus four bars, so you have some bars ahead, you can just drag this into your first bar or your zero bar. This will be your bar one, right? And from here on. And you can just finally adjust this if necessary or however you might feel it's appropriate. But this is great for handling larger sessions when you're where you're just trying to move stuff. You can also take advantage of the regions, and I will probably end up making a video on that because working around a large project with regions is is a lot easier than you think. But I'll have a video on that. On the other hand, if you have your ripple editing set as single or per track, for example, set ripple editing per track, what will happen is that these the edits or the splits that you do on one MIDI item on one track won't affect the length of the other. As you can see, if I split here and I delete, it's only moving this one. If I go into ripple editing for all tracks, what will happen is that even if I just delete this part of the MIDI item, both of them are moving. So in this case, per track might work a lot. For example, if you're trying to do a sound design session where you are just triggering a synth and you're messing around with it, looking for different sounds, uh, some electronic producers call this like the gem, uh, the gem building session, or let's call it like mining. So you're just taking stuff out of a synth, trying to find little pieces that might find that you might find interesting for later on. And this works super well because it's a lot of curation and a lot of sound selection where you can just start switching between presets and changing parameters and moving one thing or the other and without expecting anything, like just some sound design se sessions. You create a new track, you right-click your ARM track button and you record the output as stereo. You create a send by dragging from the first track into the second one, and you can call this gem search. I don't know, however you want to call it. And whenever you have this track armed, whenever you hit record, you will end up with something like this, right? And maybe you are listening to whatever you recorded. <laughs> 
and you start finding small moments that you think are super valuable. And let's suppose for a moment that you just have like a lot of small samples that you're using and you're selecting and you're trying to do fades in and fades out and such. Here, since you don't want to affect the MIDI of the session that you built, because in this case, you should be recording the automation as well, because any parameters that you move, in this case, I would take advantage of using up here, the using something like the touch automation mode that you can set it up globally up here and you can set it up to touch, but I like to have it on my keyboard. That way, whenever you're moving around, let me make a copy of this. That way, when you have these icons that are highlighted, it means that it will record the automation. This is important because whenever you're making some sound design of any kind, if you're moving a parameter, you want to be able to go back to that position, right? If you're only using touch mode, it will fall back into that position. So you might want to also try write mode. That way, whenever you move a, par a parameter, it stays right, right there. And it's writing different envelopes for automation lanes. And whenever you're trying to go back into a sound that you recorded on another track, it's going to make sense with the automation that's right above. And you can go back into that position of the plugin or that fader position of the plugin a lot easier. If you're just fiddling around and you always go want to go back to one sound, I would use touch mode. But if you want to simply evolve with the synth itself, I would go into write mode. And whenever you're done, I would go back into trim and read. So going back to the ripple modes is that when you're trying to build a sound selection section session after you did a sound design session, you probably don't need all of these muted items. So you can just delete all of them. You will have all of your new MIDI items all together. And remember that by holding shift and double clicking on the top of the MIDI item, you can start making time selections, combining that with insert region from time selection. So I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. That's probably the slowest way to do it. So probably for me, the fastest way to do this would be taking advantage of create regions from selected items named by active take or by item nodes, whichever works best for you. So I can just double click the header of my track, run this action, and now I have all of this. And using the view region marker manager, I can just finish naming this one, for example, symbol, whatever, hit tab on my keyboard, washi stuff, lead uh, sample, uh, new oscillator, and so on, right? And now that you have everything, everything named as you want it, whenever you go into your render section, whenever you want to make your all of your samples, you can just use the region render matrix, all project regions, region matrix, and you can use only the track where you recorded and do some a small selection like this. If you want all of your sample library to be more or less balanced, so you have a more or less consistent gain structure across all of your sample library, as I showed in a video on how to manage your sample library that I will link in the description. For me, I would honestly normalize to momentary minus 18 LU loudness units and not uh, normalizing by peaks because loudness is not related to peaks. It's not exactly the same as peaks. Normalize separately, I would just put a small protection of minus 0.5 dB, a really, really short uh, fade in and a really, really short fade out because remember that these ones, the fade ins might remove part of the attack if you're making sample libraries out of percussions. So either you change also the way the cross fade or the fade goes into the sample, you, you make it start a lot faster so it stabilizes really fast and the fade out could be something like this, however you see fit. But as you can see, this is a lot faster if I'm taking advantage of the ripple editing options. Probably, if you're doing any song multi-track mixing, 
Uh, ripple editing is not as useful because we are usually working within the idea that we are trying to go from a verse into a chorus, into a bridge, into a whatever. And ripple editing is probably not so useful in music. Nevertheless, if you're trying to have a lot of versatility so you can listen to your project in different ways, I would definitely use regions. If you're already this far down in the video, I highly appreciate if you want to check it out. If you want to, if you want to check the links down below, because I have a buy me a coffee link. And it's one of the ways that I can keep on making videos for anyone that's wanting to learn more about audio production or music production or all of this complex ecosystem that's trying to build music or trying to make music and putting in out there, feeling happy with the result and just making it better every single time. This isn't really Ripple related, but it's something that I also answered on the question that I saw that brought me to this video. But if you're trying to just, uh, instead of trying to remove all of this section and, may and maybe you're just not committed to it, it's easier to just move the whole section, duplicate the whole section to save it as something and add a marker at the beginning of the section and remember that we have these command IDs. So in this case, I'm using go to next marker project end, and I'm copying selected action command ID. And when you're editing the marker by holding shift and double clicking, you always have to start with this exclamation point, a small space, and then paste the command ID. That will make that whenever the cursor reaches this marker, it will execute the action. So in this case, it's jumping to the time selection because that's also part of what this action is making. So in this case, please remember that this action will also work in relationship to your time selection. So if I just play it from here, it will jump here, right? Into the middle of this time selection, even though if it's in the region that I'm trying to skip. But if I have a larger time selection and I hit play, it's going to jump from region one to region three. And now it makes a lot more sense. Or you can use go to time select next marker region, and then it can ignore time selection. I will just paste it, right? And it's moving and selecting the next region. There are so many ways to use this creatively for your own workflow. For me, Reaper is about finding your workflow. And whenever you stumble into new situations, it's your job to try and figure out how to make it better for you because you're the one using it. No one is doing the stuff for you. And if you want to be faster, eventually you have to go a little bit deeper into this kind of workflow. Be sure to check out any of my other Reaper workflow videos or overall recording uh, workflow suggestions when practicing recording multi-track sessions, exporting recording modes, uh, making custom toolbars, and many other options that I have on my channel learn free scenes, uh, some free plugins as well. And if you like this kind of videos, be sure to comment, like, subscribe, and do all of those things that people on YouTube say. I deeply appreciate it, so I can invest a lot more time making this video so you can learn for free. Straight from Mexico City, my name is Juanchis, and thanks for listening.